Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to finish up uh, our lecture from last time talking about alternative fuel vehicles. Um, we're actually going to probably have a slightly shorter lecture today. I think we're halfway through or more than halfway through and uh, it'll be good to, to take somewhat of a, a mental break, I think. Um, and so anyways, uh, not many announcements uh, today, um, but again, we'll just pick up where we left off from last time. Um, so we had talked about alternative fuel vehicles. Um, the first one that we had looked at was um, a more depth investigation of electric vehicles. And today we'll be starting off with uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, fuel cell vehicles, I think, are, uh, di there's definitely di differing opinions about how this technology may shape up in comparison to electric vehicles. Um, there are those who think it may be a better route than electric cars. Um, and there are, there are some compelling reasons for that. Um, but the technology itself will also have some, uh, some drawbacks, which we'll talk about. Um, in terms of emissions performance, uh, they have zero tailpipe emissions. Actually, the only the only thing that, that's going to be coming out of these cars uh, as a byproduct of uh, using hydrogen is water. Uh, actually, there's, at least in the Toyota Mirai, I don't know about the other two vehicles, um, there's this little button you can press uh, after you've been driving around for a while, and it'll just squirt out water from the back uh, to release um, built-up byproduct of, of using the, the hydrogen. Um, the efficiency is is really high, uh, and the performance is is quite good. Actually, I was fairly surprised the first time that uh, I was able to drive one of these. Um, I didn't, I hadn't realized that actually uh, a lot of these fuel cell vehicles. So they they have fairly big batteries, um, similar to uh, electric vehicles, not not the same size. Um, but enough to do things like regenerative braking um, to improve efficiency. And I had been under the impression that the, the drivetrain primarily operates through the battery and that the fuel, fuel cell powers the battery. But actually in, in all of these fuel cell vehicles, um, the, the fuel cell itself is the thing that's providing direct power into the motors. So there's no battery intermediary, which means that the fuel cell itself has high enough sort of power output um, yeah, and, and so I think, I think the technology has come quite a long way over the last couple decades. Um, the last two aspects uh, in, in this first bullet about fast refueling and long range, I think are probably two of the characteristics that, that really distinguish it from electric vehicles. Um, when it comes to fast refueling, as we talked about last time, um, the the time that it takes to charge up your car can be on the order of, of several hours, right? Even with a pretty fast charger, you could you could have to wait for you know an hour or so. Um, however, with fuel cell vehicles, it's basically the same as pumping a gas car. So you drive up to a station uh, and you, you uh, pump hydrogen, um, uh, hydrogen fuel into your vehicle uh, and that, that'll take you know, on the order of, of five minutes or so. Um, the, the refueling itself, is is slightly different. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it does operate under a, extremely high pressure, um, and so there are safety aspects related to that. Uh, and then the last one about long range, um, the the hydrogen vehicles, uh, in comparison to electric vehicles, 
it's it's a lot easier, right? So you you can you can put in a large tank um, that that can go on the order of you know 300, 400 uh, miles. So it's really comparable to the the types of vehicles uh, that we see today. And insofar as uh, you know, some folks believe that it may be difficult to reach 100% adoption of electric vehicles because of some of the drawbacks with refueling and long range. Um, a lot of folks point to hydrogen vehicles as, as the technology that's able to sort of fulfill that, that gap. Um, there's already uh, thousands of fuel cell vehicles uh, deployed worldwide. Um, and, and in California, I think there's probably around uh, 10,000 fuel cell vehicles that, that have been sold. A lot of them are, are not on the road anymore, um, but, but some examples of current existing models that, that you would be able to go um, and buy or lease. Uh, actually, most of these vehicles are only available for lease. Uh, the Toyota Mirai, the Hyundai Nexo, which is um, the newest one, uh, and the Honda Clarity. The Honda Clarity itself is, is a little bit confusing because Honda has made a fuel cell version of the Clarity, a uh, full battery electric uh, vehicle version of the Clarity, and a, and a plug-in hybrid. So you have, to, you have to specify which technology uh, you're talking about when you're discussing the, the Honda Clarity. Um, and, and that's actually only just for passenger transport. There actually exists um, hydrogen versions of, of transportation um, throughout the world. Uh, this is on, on, the, on the far left, this is a famous ship powered entirely by, by hydrogen. Um, this is a commuter rail that I believe is located in, um, in the UK. Uh, powered by hydrogen, um, maybe the most familiar to, to some of you if you've taken transit around the Bay Area. There are actually um, a handful of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that operate on the AC transit lines in the Bay. Um, yeah, uh, I've, I've ridden them before. They're, um, they're a lot quieter, right, than, than your typical um, natural gas or, or diesel buses, um, both of which usually have, have engines, whereas the fuel cell vehicle uh, has none of that, that engine noise. Um, there are uh, actual experimental planes that run on, on hydrogen. Uh, you can't, there aren't any planes where you can get like a commercial flight or anything, um, but, uh, there's a there's a possibility for and potential for that fuel being used in, in aviation and I think probably one of the biggest potentials um, is in the freight and trucking industry um, the this is a this is a prototype bus from um, a company called Nikola which is um, responsible for um, the development and production of um, tractor trailer, sort of, you know, 18 wheelers um, sized hydrogen uh, trucking. And that is actually a technology that is um, well suited for, for hydrogen. Uh, so when I was talking about the, um, the issues about electrification as it relates to range and recharging, all of those issues essentially get scaled up um, as you go to uh, more more duty cycle or heavier duty cycles. So if it's if it's traveling much farther, um, and as you go to uh, continuous highway speeds, uh, the efficiency makes a lot more sense for fuel cell vehicles. Um, and so here we can see kind of a high level diagram about uh, where we think it makes the most sense to deploy fuel cell vehicles. Um, and so at, last time I was 
uh, discussing some of these trade-offs about electric vehicle batteries. And uh, as, you, as you get to larger sized vehicles, um, it's not only about you know, putting more batteries to increase the range of the vehicle um, because it's bigger and heavier, but also the characteristics of the battery being able to provide enough power to, to drive um, you know, a, uh, a light duty pickup truck or a bus or even a, a semi. Um, it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, and, and that's where uh, hydrogen um, can, can shine because uh, you still run into some of these issues, uh, but the scaling as you go from, you know, weight and power uh, on upwards is not as big of an issue for fuel cells as it is for electric vehicles. Um, this is kind of a, a similar type of diagram, uh, but instead of uh, back here looking at the the drive, drive and duty cycle, we're looking at the weight of the vehicle and uh, how much it drives in, in a given day. Uh, and, and this is essentially a, a similar type of diagram where we are thinking about um, in the shorter range, uh, lower weight vehicles uh, as kind of ideal for electrification um, and in this sort of middle area and, and, and onwards, uh, thinking a lot more about using uh, hydrogen. I will say that I think both of these charts are a little bit outdated. Um, in the more recent years with uh, some of the longer range battery electric vehicles uh, coming into play, uh, I think that this sort of area has expanded quite a bit. Um, especially because battery prices have fallen faster than most people have expected. Uh, and, and so what that means is that um, to get to a higher range and to allow for higher weight, um, actually the, the batteries uh, have been improving at, at a rate where there, there are some people uh, now who, who even think that 100% electrification you know, of the light duty fleet is is possible even with without um, fuel cell vehicles, uh, and, and so it's it's definitely um, it, it's it's definitely not something that's been set in stone uh, about the success of particular uh, technology types, um, and and you can definitely find differing opinions about um, whether or not fuel cell vehicles are going to be playing. An important role in, in, in the future. Okay, um, I wanted to provide a sort of quick rundown of how a hydrogen fuel cell works. Um, so the basis of hydrogen fuel cells uh, are essentially from coming from this equation. So this is the combination of hydrogen gas with oxygen gas um, to make water. And that it turns out that that is a, an exothermic reaction, which means you are able to uh, get energy out of it. Um, and it, it's actually a fairly substantial amount of, of energy. Um, and in, in order to uh, capture it in, in the most uh, efficient manner possible, um, they combine it in a fuel cell. Uh, and so the fuel cell essentially generates an electric current as uh, protons move to uh, combine with oxygen. Uh, and, and that generates um, this current that can power, for example, a, a motor to, to drive your vehicle. Um, and so you typically need a, uh, a stream of, of hydrogen um, and then from from the air, you can extract oxygen. So you can actually make this process more efficient if you had a pure stream of oxygen, but that is um, pretty uncommon in real world applications. Um, 
so so outside of like laboratories i mean um and and the reason for that is you know it's already it's already kind of expensive um to and 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 takes a lot of storage uh to be able to provide a stream of pure hydrogen um and you have enough oxygen in the air to allow for this sort of process to to be occurring so you pass air through um through the fuel cell uh and and so most of the fuel cell vehicles or sorry all of the fuel cell vehicles are just using um the ambient air in order to provide oxygen into the fuel cell and then they they will directly connect to a tank of hydrogen to provide the uh, hydrogen fuel side um, there is typically a catalyst to facilitate um, the reaction to happen uh, that lowers the um, the barrier um, for the reaction to take place uh, the energy barrier for the um, reaction to take place. Um, yeah, and so as you combine the hydrogen oxygen and, and you get electricity, um, that allows for the vehicle to be powered. And in practice, uh, you're getting about uh, 300 miles for about five kilograms of hydrogen. Um, Five kilograms doesn't seem like a lot, uh, right? You're talking about something on the order of, uh, you know, 10, 10 pounds of, of hydrogen. Um, but actually, if you think about hydrogen, it is, it's literally the, the lightest element on our periodic, periodic table. Uh, and so um, 10 pounds of, of hydrogen is actually a fairly substantial amount. And in order to, um, in, in order to fuel up a hydrogen tank, uh, you need uh, something on the order of 10,000 uh, PSI. So it, it operates under extremely high pressure. Um, the storage devices in hydrogen vehicles are actually very complex, um, and a lot of engineering goes into them in order to make sure that, one, not only can they you know, withstand the pressure uh, to prevent a lot of uh, the fuel from escaping. Hydrogen is one of the most, uh, if not the most notorious fuel for storage because it leaks so much. It's, it's such a small, uh, um, it's such a small molecule. Uh, you need to prevent leaks. And then three, um, it, it's designed with a lot of sort of safety features in, in, in mind because hydrogen is extremely reactive uh, and extremely combustible. Okay. Um, I guess we didn't talk so much about the emissions, uh, upstream emissions related to electricity. Um, and so as, as you can imagine, depending on the source that you're generating uh, electricity from, that can make your electric vehicles be um, cleaner or dirtier. Um, and, and actually that, that is a, a lot of what, what I do research on. And one of the things, um, actually, okay, so I see a quick question here. Would car crashes be much more dangerous if there were more hydrogen vehicles? Well, we're actually gonna talk about that in, in a second. So uh, I'm gonna hold off on, on that. Um, so with electricity, uh, a large area of my research is, is trying to look at um, emissions associated with charging of electric vehicles. And so one of the most common questions that I get asked is, oh, uh, if you take into account um, the charging from the grid and uh, the emissions associated with, with, um, with supplying the electricity, are electric cars cleaner or dirtier than uh, gas cars and of course i i kind of say that the answer is is complicated but generally uh in in almost all regions of the country uh you are going to have uh cleaner uh, outcomes if you drive electric vehicles versus uh gas vehicles so this is 
especially true in places like California, which doesn't have any coal electricity. Um, but if, if you're in, uh, for example, West Virginia, um, an electric car might be somewhat comparable to driving uh, maybe an average uh, gas car today or, or slightly better than average gas car today. Uh, but that's, but it also, it's complicated because it also depends on, right, what time of the day that you're charging, how much you're charging, you know, how fast, uh, if you are, um, yeah, how fast you're charging, if you're charging in a DC fast charge charger versus if you're charging at home, um, they can have different implications for what sorts of power plants um, turn on. But generally, electric vehicles are going to be quite a bit cleaner. Um, so th that same logic holds for hydrogen vehicles. Um, like electricity, hydrogen is an energy carrier, um, right? So with electricity, you can store it in the battery. With hydrogen, um, it's stored as this chemical form of energy. Uh, and that can be produced from a lot of different primary energy resources. Um, one of the really big benefits of hydrogen in this regard is that uh, you can imagine that with electricity, if I'm charging my vehicle, it has to be charging at certain times, right? So whenever I have access to, um, when I have access to the plug, so if I am charging in public or I'm charging at home or I'm charging at work, all of the charging has to happen while the vehicle is there. For hydrogen, you actually have a lot more flexibility, right? Because the, the time in which you make the hydrogen doesn't have to be connected to the time where the car needs the hydrogen. So I could, for example, um, I could produce all the hydrogen during the day when there's a lot of solar, uh, and then I can store that hydrogen and then provide it at the pump for vehicles when they need them. As opposed to if I'm driving an electric vehicle and I only am able to charge at home, uh, if I go to work during the day, then I can't charge uh, during the day when there's a lot of solar, I have to charge at night. Um, and so hydrogen definitely gets uh, some of these advantages in being a lot more flexible um, for, for using, um, for, for producing the fuel. Uh, and so if you think back to last lecture when we were talking about um, vehicle to grid, about how you know, vehicles could store electricity in their battery and dispense when you know, prices go, go up and you could even make some, some money that way, with hydrogen, um, you are sort of inherently able to, to do that already. And so there may be some advantages in sort of arbitraging uh, electricity for um, uh, electricity prices when you create, um, when you create hydrogen. Oops. Um, there are two main configurations for hydrogen production. Um, and there isn't really sort of one agreed upon production method yet, especially because the technology hasn't been sort of super well developed. Um, and so you have what's known as on-site hydrogen production. And so this would be something like uh, producing the hydrogen uh, at the uh, station itself. Um, and so you have a hydrogen station and maybe they have a bunch of uh, solar and, and, and storage or maybe they're just directly connected to the grid. Um, and they can just produce hydrogen. Um, they can just produce hydrogen uh, to sort of meet uh, the local demand conditions. Um, and, and I should say, I don't actually think I have a, a slide on this, um, but as it relates to hydrogen, uh, the production of hydrogen is actually, um, is done in a couple ways. Ideally, the, the one that we would want is actually just an exact 
reverse of this equation where you go from water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so that's a, pro um, a process called electrolysis where you put in energy to split uh, uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but actually the vast majority of hydrogen today is produced through a process called um, steam methane reformation. Uh, and so it actually uses a chemical process to get hydrogen from natural gas. And, and that actually is a little bit dirtier. Um, so I don't think it's very likely that you would have uh, steam methane reformation or SMR um, happening at, uh, on site because the facility is it's kind of more of an industrial process and so it's unlikely that the facility would would be able to accommodate something like that um, and so when you have on-site hydrogen production one of the big benefits con compared to centralized hydrogen production is that you don't need all of the additional infrastructure, right, for like pipelines and trucking to get your hydrogen to where it's needed. Um, on the other hand, with a centralized hydrogen production, you benefit a lot more from economies of scale um, and the ability to um, produce larger volumes of, of hydrogen that can be um, distributed out to not just one, but many many different hydrogen stations. And so in, in this case, um, there, again, there isn't uh, one that's necessarily superior to the other. Um, there are examples of both on-site and central hydrogen production that, that exists today. Uh, and so as the hydrogen economy and technology continues to develop, I think eventually we'll see um, one of these uh, as uh, as sort of dominance. Although may, some people even think that that you'll you'll end up with with both. So um, yeah, jury jury's out on 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 this one right now. Um, so as I was mentioning, one of the big benefits of, of hydrogen is the ability uh, of it to be flexible in terms of storage, right? And so especially with intermittent renewables, um, I can produce hydrogen in my electrolyzer um, for uh, for when there's a lot of uh, when there's a lot of renewable sources available. And then you could actually um, you could actually run that through uh, in order to provide electricity going backwards, and so it, it's it's essentially acting uh, like a a battery, um, and so you're able to provide grid services, and then uh, the the hydrogen can also you know be used uh, in 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 mobility services. Um, and so one of the, one of the big issues these days, when we talk about, uh, full electrific, full, um, full electrification of the grid, uh, using renewable energy, as, as I've discussed a, a couple times is, is the intermittency. Uh, and we had talked about how storage would be the thing that would be needed to, uh, alleviate some of those issues um, and while while batteries are really expensive um, when when we're talking about hydrogen which which is also expensive don't get me wrong um, because it provides sort of alternative services uh, right because we're using we can use the hydrogen for uh, transportation you know it's it's got additional value that may help uh, help the case for its, its economics. Um, and so there's a lot of researchers working on this. Um, actually, the, the professor who used to teach this class, Joan Ogden, uh, so she retired, um, but she is one of the, definitely one of the leading researchers in um, the, the hydrogen world.
Uh, and so she knows tons about this um, and and can provide lots of uh, perspective. And, and actually, the one of the groups uh, for the final project is is actually working with Joan um, to to talk about uh, hydrogen futures. And so um, I think in, in a couple of weeks we'll be able to to hear from them about uh, you know exciting things that are that are happening in in the hydrogen world. Okay. Um, this is hitting on, I think, the, the, the question from earlier about whether or not car crashes would be more dangerous if there were uh, hydrogen vehicles. Um, yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, hydrogen is, as I mentioned, a, one of the, the most reactive um, chemicals out there. Uh, it's very low ignition energy. And so if you mix hydrogen and oxygen uh, in kind of an uncontrolled way, uh, you're probably gonna be in for a, a pretty bad time. Um, one, of the, one of the things, one of the interesting things about hydrogen is that uh, it has an invisible flame um, uh, because the it has very low low sort of light radiation, uh, so you could actually burn yourself very easily uh, if you you know pass your hand over uh, a hydrogen fi a flame uh, without without knowing it because it's it, it can be really difficult to see. Um, however, I think that uh, we we sort of discount how dangerous existing systems are. Um, and so gasoline is also fairly flammable. Um, and I think one of the things that people get concerned about with hydrogen is that when you store it in a vehicle, especially with the technologies today, it's at extremely high pressure. Um, and so I had mentioned um, when you fill up uh, the, the Toyota Mirai at, at a station, you, you, you actually, uh, the way that you tell that it's full isn't from like this fuel gauge that goes from uh, like E to F that you see in a normal gas car. It, it's actually, uh, it actually f uh, knows that it's full based off of this, this pressure gauge. So once you're around 10,000 PSI, you're, you're, getting, you're getting pretty full. And so that, that's extremely high pressure. And things at high pressure are typically, you know, a little bit more dangerous. Um, but, but in this case, I actually think that that is a benefit. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of a feature uh, of, of, uh, of the safety uh, for this type of technology. And that's because when you get into a car accident uh, and you rupture your fuel tank, the gasoline is gonna sort of pool in in the local area, right? Whereas if you if you rupture the hydrogen tank, the hydrogen will get dispersed into the atmosphere uh, very very quickly, um, and so so th this picture is kind of a demonstration of that uh, on on the left versus versus the right, and so. Yeah, you know, you can argue about which one is more more or less safe, um, but at least for hydrogen, it'll burn quickly and it will vent quickly, as opposed to liquid fuels, which will stick around and, and usually burn for uh, quite a long time. Um, and and there there have been a lot of studies that that actually demonstrate that hydrogen. Um, can be can be designed to be as safe, if not safer, than gasoline vehicles. Um, I think I think the one that most people worry about is like if you have some catastrophic accidents um, that the hydrogen tank itself would explode. But I think that that is really unlikely to happen because of the way that tanks are designed, and two because even if you did rupture the tank, you don't have enough oxygen mixture with the fuel for it to combust in like an explosion. It's going to, um, it's going to essentially escape really quickly. 
um, because it's under such high pressure that it never really has an opportunity to um, mix with uh, air enough to provide like a, an explosion. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, that answers uh, uh, your question. I think that most experts will agree that, that even existing commercial hydrogen vehicles today are just as safe as, as gas cars. We've, we've, we've literally never had an uh, incident where a uh, car has exploded um, from an accident with in, in, in the hydrogen technology. Uh, and I'm not sure you can say the same about gas cars, although obviously the sample size is really different. Um, okay. As it pertains to emissions, this is this is a chart of comparing um, the sort of range of emissions that we see from different fuel types. Um, and so, gasoline standard is is sort of up here, um, and Depending, again, depending on the source of the hydrogen, um, it can look something like this. And so a lot of what we see um, uh, today is, for, for hydrogen is from steam methane reformation, which is coming from natural gas. And so that looks something like this. Um, with, oh, sorry, actually, I just noticed, so 430, yeah, that's that's more, this so, okay, this is grams of CO2 per mile, yeah. So this this would be, I think this is kind of a the dirtiest, uh, or not the dirtiest, but a fairly dirty um, uh, combustion engine vehicle. So this would, 430 would be probably around uh, maybe 18 to 20 um, miles per gallon. Um, I think this this number is 220, let's see. Yeah, because the number that I have for a Toyota Prius would be about 160. So this isn't like necessarily the cleanest vehicle, um, but it, it's a little bit cleaner than average. I'm not sure why they're using a 220 as a base. Um, the average vehicle is probably around 270 uh, to 300 grams of CO2 per mile, and that would be something like a 25 to 27 mile per gallon car. Um, so this is like a cleaner than average vehicle. Um, anyways, so 190, you're gonna be slightly dirtier than, um, than a Toyota Prius, but cleaner than, right, the most of the vehicles um, that are out there. Uh, if you sequester some of the byproducts, you can get that down. Uh, and then if you're using renewable energy, you get quite a bit lower. Um, why are there still uh, uh, emissions? That has to do with, um, with transportation of the fuel. Um, and I, I believe that this is, yeah, so this is centralized. All of these are centralized. Uh, and so most of these emissions are gonna have to do with distributing the uh, hydrogen from your centralized production facility out to the station. Okay, and so you can compare that against uh, hybrid vehicles and other electric vehicles. In terms of commercialization, um, you know, I think that these vehicles do still have a while to go, but I think they're also farther along than uh, a, what a lot of people realize. Um, there are already uh, fuel cell vehicles. So this, this slide is, is quite a bit older uh, in, in 2016. Um, there are a number of uh, prototype and, and pilot vehicles um, that a lot of existing automakers have, have already designed and, and made. Um, 
the the three that I had shown uh, in in the first slide for the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle technology are ones that are I wouldn't say necessarily mass market, but you can definitely find them, especially in places like California, in dealerships around the state. Um, and there are quite a few more models that are going to be released in the next couple of years. I think, I think the first sort of really big one um, was the, the Mirai. Uh, and, and so this sedan um, came out in 2014. Um, in 2015, they were selling, you know, a couple hundred. Uh, but by 2016, 2017, um, they were selling thousands of these vehicles um, in, in Japan and in California. Actually, there's, there's a couple of these hanging around in, in Davis. Uh, the department head for the Institute of Transportation Studies used to uh, have one. Um, he leased it for, for a couple of years. Uh, there's also a professor in the econ department who, who had one. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of drivability, they drive just like a gas car. Well, they they drive basically the same as an electric car. Um, and so if you if you haven't driven um, if you haven't driven an electric car, the throttle response is is really different. Uh, you have a a totally linear throttle response because you don't have to change gears in in a trans through a transmission system, um, and so you don't get that sort of revvy feel from from um, uh, from the engine uh, of a gas car like you do, um, or, or that you that you wouldn't get in an electric vehicle and in, and in a hydrogen vehicle. Um, actually, the nearest place there's actually only one one hydrogen station near Davis, um, and that's in <clears throat> that's in West Sacramento. Um, and so they would they would have to drive out to West Sac in order to to fill up the the vehicle, which is slightly inconvenient uh, for sure. Um, and so, in terms of infrastructure elsewhere in California, there are actually about thirty four hydrogen stations. Um, and so, this is a map of where those stations are located in the Bay Area. Uh, and in Los Angeles. Um, definitely not as prevalent as um, as gas stations or even as charging stations. As I talked about last time, there's you know 20,000 in, in California. Um, but the hydrogen stations themselves can be pretty expensive to um, build and deploy. Uh, and so the state is providing a lot of extra incentives for um, folks to install hydrogen stations. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about, um, about policies that, that help um, support hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, in, in future lectures. Um, so hydrogen, um, takeaways. It's progressing pretty rapidly. Uh, it's one of the technologies that uh, that help alleviate some of the consumer preference issues related to electric vehicles. And, and for that reason, a lot of people look at this technology as a potential, a different potential solution for um, climate change. Um, there are lots of low carbon pathways available. Um, to produce hydrogen, um, but I think one of the biggest drawbacks again is is cost. Um, in the long term, they're looking for uh, three to four dollars gallon. So GGE stands for gallons of gas equivalent um, to compete with gasoline um, at two to three dollars um, per uh, of of gasoline um, equivalents. So uh, because hydrogen vehicles are so much more efficient, uh, when you convert it into a cents per mile, even though you pay, even though the equivalent of, of a gas tank would be 
a lot more expensive, um, you are you are end up being cheaper. You you end up being cheaper because the efficiency is so much higher. To give a perspective of how much hydrogen costs right now, um, it's about uh, $15 per kilogram. Um, and so if I go back a couple slides, um, yeah, so $15 per kilogram. And so to get 300 miles on a five kilogram tank, uh, 15 times five, that's about $75 uh, right today um, for 300 miles. Um, so think about, uh, think about your gas tank in, in your vehicle. Uh, most, most gas cars are usually going around 300 miles per tank. Um, so you can compare that $75 to how much it costs um, you to fill up your, your tank today. And, and I think that's kind of the, the closest um, takeaway. I will say that if you buy a hydrogen vehicle today, they're, they're heavily subsidized and incentivized. So actually, if you get a Toyota Mirai, Toyota will give you a credit card um, that, will, uh, that will pay for all of your fuel. Uh, up to I think like sixty thousand miles for for three years, which is which is more than enough. You'd have to be driving a ridiculous amount of miles to get get up to sixty thousand miles. Uh, so basically, fuel is free uh, if you get um, a, a hydrogen vehicle today. Um, but obviously, that that's not something that'll that'll be lasting forever. Um, it's not a, a long term strategy that that company will be able to to sustain. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so basically at the end of the day, um, a lot of experts think about hydrogen as one part of a larger portfolio to make cuts in, into your uh, greenhouse gas emissions and oil use. Um, okay. Why don't we take a There's a question Oh yeah, okay. Uh how often do people charge uh the hydrogen fuel? Okay. Um I wouldn't I, so first of all, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it charging cuz you're um it, it's it's more like refueling, right? Cuz you're you're not actually using electricity here, but um it's it it depends, right? It's it's kind of the similar with with a with a gas car because you're going uh, in similar ranges, three hundred miles, four hundred miles. Um, so I would say people charge their or sorry, people people refuel their hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles probably at the same rate at which they fuel up their gas cars. Um, when I had a gas car, I probably filled it up once or twice a month. So, um, but but I probably drive a lot less than than most people. So, uh, probably something on the order of of that uh, once a week up to once a month, maybe. Okay, um, we're about an hour in. So why don't we uh, take a a uh, quick break, uh, let's say um, at uh, 10, 103, we'll, we'll recontinue.
Hi, Professor. This is Dosley. I have a question about one of the slides. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you used the number 430 and pointed to uh, 190. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't get it. What do you mean by using 100? Like, the, that's the updates data or what? Oh, no, this is um, what I meant is this 430 number is a comparison against. Um, so this is a gas car essentially compared to a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle uh, oh. in terms of emissions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's continue on. Um, so the, the sort of last set of um, alternative fuel vehicles I'll be talking about is uh, biofuels. Um, and so to talk real quickly about the technology, um, maybe some of you guys have seen these uh, little placards on, on other vehicles before that say flex fuel or or there, there's, a, there's actually a couple other uh, little insignias um, that, that designate this there. I think there's like a partial, partial zero emission vehicle um, badge that, that uh, some automakers put on their vehicle. Um, and so I think a lot of people don't realize, um, but the technology for biofuel vehicles is really prevalent. Um, and so even in the United States, um, the annual flex fuel vehicles is, uh, so this data is pretty old, but um, on the order of, of several million vehicles. And so in the US, we sell, um, you know, depending on economic conditions, between 10 to 15 million vehicles per year. So flex fuel vehicles actually account for um, maybe uh, a third a quarter to a third, um, maybe even higher at this point of, of all vehicles being sold in the country. And, and actually most people just don't even realize when they, when they have a flex fuel vehicle that they're actually um, able to drive on um, a high, per, um, high percentages of, of ethanol. Um, in, in other words, uh, you can get up to uh, around E85, 85% uh, ethanol. Um, and there's, there's a pretty fascinating reason for why this is, um, and, and we'll talk about some of the policies that have driven this, um, but I think more, more simply, automakers incorporating this into the vehicle 
is actually really quite straightforward. Um, and so you can convert a gas vehicle to be able to accommodate both um, gasoline and uh, ethanol um, with really cheap, small modifications to the vehicle. And, and these actually are things that, that you might not even expect, right? And so uh, one of the only hardware things that you really need to do is, um, is create uh, or, or is to add uh, these O-ring seals to um, the fuel in, in injectors because ethanol will will degrade the the seals, um, and and that costs something like a hundred bucks to do, uh, and and there are a couple other things um, modifications, but again, uh, it's it's fairly cheap and easy, and so a lot of the automakers get some incentives to to do this. Um, from a from a policy perspective, and because it's so easy, they uh, they are able to incorporate these um, without too much of an issue. Uh, so, from a technology perspective, uh, fuel, flex fuel vehicles or vehicles that are able to to use biofuels um, is definitely way more developed um, and not really difficult um, compared to electric vehicles and uh, fuel cell vehicles. Um, but there are lots of challenges um, for sustainability, um, technical challenges not in using them, but in producing the biofuels, uh, logistic challenges, which is one of the biggest issues um, for large scale deployments. Uh, as I mentioned before, most of the biofuels are produced in the Midwest, um, coming from the sort of agriculture capital, um, whereas most of the vehicles are located on each of the coasts where the big cities are. Um, and so getting all that fuel out to the, to the cities, uh, there, there are some logistical issues. Um, and then uh, policy challenges and well again this is something we'll talk about in, in the future but the way that some biofuel policies have been designed uh, are more sort of designed to be um, supporting specific um, uh, groups um, rather than encouraging sort of sustainability. Um, so in terms of production, um, I've shown similar types of charts um, before about how you turn uh, biomass uh, and agricultural um, output, you know, either corn, sugarcane, um, or even vegetable oils and animal fats through different processes in order to uh, generate uh, specific types of fuel. So the most common uh, uh, is is like ethanol, but you also have things like biodiesel and, and uh, green diesel. Um, oops, a lot of the um, synthesis of uh, traditional gasoline, diesel, jet fuel can be um, a little bit more intensive, a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, and so I would say a lot of the targets for production of, of biofuels is uh, looking at uh, production of, of ethanol and, and biodiesel. Um, the cost, uh, the cost to produce biofuels um, can be seen here. Again, this this chart is is quite a bit older, and so the prices have shifted somewhat, um, but still relatively similar. Um, and these are all translated into uh, gallons of gasoline equivalent. So you can think of this as what you would essentially pay at the pump to get these fuels. Um, and note that in in this time frame, uh, gasoline was probably you know closer uh, oh, right here, uh, wholesale gasoline 
is is provided here as a baseline quite a bit quite a bit cheaper no, and note this is wholesale gasoline not retail and so there are you know uh, markups that happen so uh, it'll definitely end up being um, a little bit more expensive at the pump uh, but you can see that basically all of um, the fuels are are a little bit more expensive and so it can have a hard time competing with gasoline now as of more recently you know these prices have shifted downwards as um, the production of biofuels has been um, a little bit more developed over the last decade and supported um, through through policy um, but there are issues with sustainability and and these are some things that we've touched on in, in previous lectures when we've talked about biofuels um, but crop, a lot of the crop-based biofuels can compete um, with global agriculture um, and that has a lot of impacts that you might want to avoid. So increasing food prices, um, which is a big issue for equity, expansion of cultivated lands. This is a really, really big issue in places like um, uh, Brazil where um, uh, large, large swaths of the Amazon rainforest, for example, are being cleared in order to um, in order to make uh, room for farming uh, and, and agricultural use that produces um, fuels for um, both for the country and, and for export. Um, intensification of, of land use, uh, which, which can be uh, not desirable. Um, so it can lead to bad farming practices, especially when you're doing like monocultures um, buildup of uh, fertilizer and, and pesticides. Um, yeah, and so a lot of these um, a lot of these growth patterns, especially with monocultures, can have long term impacts on on soil quality and, and impacts on the ecosystem. So these are generally um, uh, the host of issues that are commonly associated with um, use of, of crop based biofuels. Um, and the other thing is that the, that there's quite a bit of uncertainty with the emissions associated with the use of, uh, and production of, of different types of, of ethanol. Um, and so this is a chart which, uh, provides a baseline of zero at equivalent emissions for gasoline. Um, and and you can see that there is um, there is a lot of discussion uh, about whether or not it's uh, lower or higher emissions than gasoline. And this this paper actually is is a pretty um, famous um, study that actually um, that was published in in the early two thousand tens. From Carnegie Mellon, and and they they were able to to include one of these key issues with uh, biofuels, which which I had touched on before regarding indirect land use change that showed uh, a high amount of uncertainty in in the emissions uh, of of biofuels, and and that actually had a, a pretty big impact on uh, policy developments regarding um, emissions associated with, with biofuels. Um, and, and one of the, the key things of measuring emissions uh, is to take a life cycle analysis approach in, um, in biofuels uh, because it's, again, it's not only about uh, what's coming out of the tailpipe when you use biofuels, which is gonna look similar to gasoline, um, but with the argument that a lot of that CO2 is sequestered in, in the plant and drawn in from the atmosphere in the first place, you have to take a really close look at all the sort of upstream processes with biofuels in order to really get a good handle of, um, of what the actual emissions um, over the life cycle of the fuel looks like. Um, and so here, I'm just providing a, a quick look at um, at the different stages of production that are typically included in 
uh, life cycle analysis. Um, and so this, this diagram here is, uh, is kind of the boundary of the production process of producing biofuels from corn feedstock or producing biofuels from uh, switchgrass. Um, this is, uh, the, these two figures are coming from that uh, paper that I had mentioned um, where they're looking at uh, the components of production um, that lead to emissions as well as the uncertainty of the emissions. And so if our average gasoline is here for grams of CO2 per megajoule um, uh, at around, I think this number is uh, 92 or 93, um, grams of CO2 per megajoule, uh, you can see how the distribution of emissions for um, biofuels uh, looks, compares to, to gasoline. And so you can see for biofuels that are produced from corn, uh, a lot of times these distributions are, um, have a large amount of area above the gasoline point, which, which means that most of the time, you know, incorporating all this uncertainty, that they're actually gonna be dirtier than gasoline, as opposed to if you're producing a ethanol from like a switch, um, I believe this is a switch grass, um, then you're actually doing a, a lot better than gasoline. So the source of the about fuel production can actually play a really, Big impact on the emissions outcomes. Uh, and we can see uh, from this bar graph the, the different components of the emissions. So the production, the growth, uh, transportation of the biofuels. Um, you have uh, probably the, the one thing that, that is uh, and, and has been controversial over the last decade uh, is this issue of direct land use. So DLUC and ILUC, uh, ILUC, um, this stands for direct land use change and indirect land use change. Um, and so what, what a lot of these um, studies did was to identify uh, if I were to start producing, if I were to take a farmer in the Midwest and have them switch their corn production for feeds, for feedstock for agriculture to, um, to producing corn for biofuels uh, because that now changes the, the dynamics for demand of the food uh, or, or feed that they use um, for uh, providing um, food for like cattle. Uh, now that needs to get imported. And so what, what ends up happening is that as you replace uh, corn production in the U.S., they would import um, increased production from other countries. And a lot of this actually is having to do with uh, like deforestation in, in other countries that are leading to uh, these higher impacts. And so it's a really complex and, and complicated process of, of trying to figure out uh, these, these upstream emissions. But, but you can see that if I didn't include this red bar here, it would make uh, it would make um, the the use of biofuels from uh, from from corn ethanol to be actually a lot cleaner than than gasoline, um, and so it's it's really important that we are able to really carefully study this issue and be able to take into account um, things that that would be maybe a little bit more difficult to, to see uh, directly without you know, having conducted uh, research on it. Um, okay, I think this is kind of rehashing some of the, the earlier slides, um, but so, so I'm gonna skip forward. Um, yeah, and so I think um, as a lot of these studies sort of rolled out, um, this is a this is a comparison of a of a different study that 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 looked at it. Um, I think that a lot of scientists and policymakers came sort of to the realization um, that certain types of biofuels are going to be 
um, a lot less uh, beneficial and sustainable for uh, the environment and, and for, for climate change. Um, and so this has kind of put a damper, I think, on a lot of new developments for the sort of um, old school biofuel production through, through corn pathways. Um, but I think there's, it, it has also led to sort of invigorating um, alternative pathways through things like uh, sugarcane or switchgrass or other um, feedstocks for um, producing, producing ethanol. Uh, and again, that, that may be one, of, one part of the portfolio in the future um, when, we, when we think about long-term uh, climate change goals. There definitely still is a, uh, a group of people uh, who, who look to biofuels as one of the you know, potential uh, fuels and, and mechanisms to, to reduce um, CO2 in, in the future. Um, and, and so just to, to give some example of, of that, um, this is uh, this is a scenario from the International Energy Agency, the IEA, uh, looking at a low carbon future. And in, and in this case, they're actually showing expanded use of, of biofuels. Um, and, and those biofuels, I think, are, are, are being produced in a more sustainable manner, oftentimes coupled with uh, carbon sequestration uh, as actually a way of getting net negative carbon because uh, the use of biofuels, if done correctly, is kind of uh, considered to be uh, net neutral in terms of carbon, right? Because whatever you emit from the burning, you have to suck up in growing the plants for CO2. Um, so if you sequester uh, carbon at any point in this, um, in this cycle, then you are actually going to be reducing CO2 in, in the atmosphere. Um, and so people actually point to biomass as one of the, uh, especially in the transportation sector, one of the only ways that you're able to do a net negative carbon uh, impact. And so that's why you still see a lot of these uh, scenarios, despite the fact that we've seen uh, more contemporary studies uh, showing um, negative emission uh, or not not negative emissions uh, increased emissions of, of co2 for certain types of biomass um, because it has the potential to do things like negative emissions um, you future scenarios that that look at carbon reduction and mitigation uh, still consider biomass to be a, a critical um, field um, Advanced fossil pathways. Um, I, I just really wanted to quickly touch on this because it is uh, in the discussion in, in the uh, scientific community, but, but I think that um, there are lots and lots of uh, potential drawbacks with advanced fossil pathways. And so what, what we're talking about here is um, the use of other uh, fossil fuels um, and the use of synthetic fossil uh, fossil fuels um, or synthetic fuels. Um, so natural gas uh, in the transportation sector, um, CNG is actually already uh, has, has played a large role in, in high mileage fleet fleets because of efficiencies um, and plays uh, a small role in, uh, for example, uh, public transit, so with buses, um, and, and it's thought as a potential uh, fuel in the future for things like heavy duty freight. Um, and a lot of folks think that the advantages, that there are bigger advantages with liquid fuels, uh, and so chemical conversion of natural gas into uh, these synthetic fuels may be a, a different pathway to um, uh, significant market penetration. Um, yeah, I tend to think that this is like uh, 
the only people who who really are pursuing this um, at least uh, thinking about this on on a commercial scale are oil companies uh, and so um, if you want to avoid fossil fuels in the future, one way you can get a, get around this is to do uh, synthetic fuels where you are producing gasoline through chemical processes um, rather than you know drilling it uh, out and refining it out of oil. Um, yeah, and so I think that there are a number of drawbacks here. I think that a lot of the uh, advanced uh, fossil fuels and synthetic fuels. So not only are they really expensive, um, but they're also uh, um, they're also not necessarily uh, any cleaner than um, existing fossil fuel solutions. Um, and so, as a way to address resource adequacy, yeah, maybe. But um, I think I think that the potential of the other advanced technologies um, is providing a lot of the benefits that we're that we want and therefore are moving towards so to me I think a lot of these synthetic fuels uh, and things like unconventional oil are are not going to be uh, really desirable um, especially from the consumer side in in the future um, yeah it, I, I don't think that any of these fossil fuel solutions really take into account um, a lot of the environmental difficulties um, that already exist with uh, current day fuels. Um, and then from an economic perspective, I've shown this type of graph before. This is a supply cost curve, but the way that we produce gasoline and, and oil derived products um, cost something uh, on the order of this. And as we run out of more and more of these fuels and we start to look into other sorts of uh, advanced sources, it's just gonna get more expensive. And, and there are a lot of other reasons for sustainability and environment uh, for why we don't wanna do these. Okay, so to kind of wrap up, um, how do you, how do future transportation fuels compare? Um, I'm gonna sort of leave these uh, as open-ended for, for you guys to think about. These are sort of the categories uh, in which you should consider when, uh, when you think about uh, you know, one fuel versus another, right? There, there are many sort of different cons considerations and uh, through each of these categories, certain fuels may um, maybe better than uh, than other fuels and maybe worse uh, than than other fuels for for different reasons right and so consumer acceptance um, getting people to actually use it uh, and be comfortable with it um, that can be a big driver of this the success the technical status and, and prospects so the technology itself like how how refined is it uh, is there still more potential to make improvements um, in the technology's ability to, to use the fuel and to be efficient? Um, infrastructure and logistics, uh, you know, the production of the fuel for the vehicle has to be transported from where it's being made. Um, and, and that in itself um, has a lot of big implications as well as re refueling infrastructure, right? It's not easy to build. Uh, electric vehicle chargers or hydrogen um, fueling stations that can be costly. Um, the whole economics of it uh, and whether or not it's cheap enough that you can get people to buy it. Um, environment and sustainability, one of the, probably one of the driving reasons for why we are uh, even pursuing technologies different from uh, gasoline in the first place. Uh, and then all of the dynamics about how you're shifting from the status quo into, into the, the new technology and how easy that transition is with one technology versus another. So these are all aspects that we've sort of uh, been touching on throughout this lecture and, and the last lecture that are um, important to think about uh, as, as you do this transition. Um, and, and I think 
hopefully I've been giving this perspective that um, that there is no sort of clear winner, right? And so when, when someone asks, you know, do I think it's gonna be all electric vehicles in the future or all hydrogen vehicles in the future or, or maybe even all biofuels, um, I don't think that there is, I don't think anyone has has come to a consensus or agreement on that. Um, each of the pathways has very different challenges. Um, and a lot of a lot of scientists believe that you can't achieve um, any sort of serious climate change scenario um, for climate mitigation um, with a single technology, um, and and so that might be right. We we may be seeing combinations of biofuels and hydrogen vehicles and electric vehicles in in the future. Um, and so in what's known as a portfolio approach, this means that you have to think about the sort of different niche and needs of the different technologies, what they're best able to fulfill uh, to give us our, our best chance at meeting a sustainable future. Um, and so there's a lot of research that goes into uh, figuring out how to uh, accomplish that. Um, and on sort of on a more optimistic note, um, I think that there's been a lot of investment into new technologies. Um, it, yes, it's going to cost a lot of money, um, but I think uh, I think that we are sort of well on on our way there. Um, I'm I guess I'm sort of more of an optimist when it comes to these kind of things. Uh, people point to electric vehicles and they say, oh, you know, look, it's only at one to 2% of the market in the US. It's still got a long way to go. Um, but I think a different way of looking at it is that how far we've come in such a short amount of time, right? So gas cars have been around uh, for over a hundred years now. And so you're talking about a new technology that has come in to compete against a, a, a hundred year old, a century old incumbent technology. Um, and in the span of just 10 years, right, we are, we are uh, less than 10 years out from the first commercial or mass commercial electric vehicle. Uh, and in California, we already have, um, I think something like 700,000 to 800,000 of these vehicles were at 10% of the market. Um, in, in some countries such as Norway, they're already at halfway of, of all of their vehicle sales are all elect, are electric vehicles. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a long way to go, but we've, we've come pretty far pretty quickly. Um, so in terms of investment costs and, and fuel costs, again, this is looking at uh, a future scenario. Um, and, and I think one of the big benefits actually is in this transition, uh, there's been a lot of work that has gone to show that the future vehicles are, are actually good for our, um, uh, uh, for our, not only for sustainability, but good for our wallets, right? The, the current day issue is that a lot of the costs are just more expensive than a gas car. I mean, when, when you think about, you know, purely from an individual perspective, it can be daunting to want to invest in the technology that is newer and more expensive. But in the long run, I think most experts agree that the, the, the costs that are associated with the, uh, additional um, uh, additional costs associated with the technology are going to be far outweighed by the fuel savings. Um, and so I think that that points to a beneficial potential for transition in the future. Um, as it, When it comes down to economics, uh, as these things are demonstrated to be cheaper, I think that's when you're going to see a lot bigger transition towards uh, these technologies. Um, yeah, and so in the transportation sector, one of the most difficult to decarbonize, uh, 
uh, there's a there's a huge amount of work um, to get us to transition to these new technologies, and and that's going to be necessary to be able to cut our emissions down by, you know, 2040 2050 timeline. Um, again, a portfolio strategy is needed, and that you can't have a single technology dominate in in the future. Um, because they're able to efficiently cover uh, different um, applications in transportation. That's, I think that's why you're going to see um, more development of uh, both biofuels and hydrogen and uh, electric vehicles all sort of all in conjunction. Um, okay, so Near-term actions, uh, I think, are still necessary. Um, so increased efficiency of internal combustion engine vehicles. So just because we're transitioning towards uh, advanced technology and alternative fuel vehicles doesn't mean we can just ignore internal combustion engine vehicles. And, and I think this is a point that's lost even among uh, some in the scientific community today um, who just want to focus on uh, like hydrogen and electrification, um, the, the by far the biggest emission benefits you're going to get uh, um, in the short term are going to be increasing efficiency of internal combustion engine vehicles and not getting more people to switch into electric and, and hydrogen vehicles. Um, and, and in fact, that, that is sort of well documented uh, at, especially in, in the policy realm for things like uh, cafe standards, which are trying to improve the efficiency of, of the vehicles. Uh, those have saved billions and billions of, of tons of CO2 from going into the atmosphere um, over the, the, the last couple decades. Um, and so it's important not to ignore these vehicles as you transition to, to new technologies. Um, yeah, and so in addition to, to um, what we've been talking about with the existing alternative fuel vehicles, there's still R&D on more revolutionary technologies, and so should not ignore that as well. And you need to continue R&D um, for electric vehicles and, and hydrogen vehicles in order to um, promote future versions of these technologies to be you know even better than than what exists today um okay yeah so um that is the last slide of the day um we'll we'll end a little bit earlier uh, as as i had mentioned um actually this lecture ended up taking longer than than i was expecting it to um but i think it'll be good to to have a little bit of a break, a uh, mental break for everyone um, as, the, as the quarter continues on. So um, we'll, we'll end here for today and I'll hang around a couple minutes if there's any questions um, and, and we can take, take that a little bit more, more slowly than being rushed at the, at the end of lecture as, as we normally are. Um, but if folks have questions on uh, homework or projects or any of the material in the lecture, I'm happy to to stick around and, and chat. Uh, otherwise, yeah, have a good rest of the day and, and week, and I will see you guys um, next Monday.